Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Black in Mayberry panel discussion uh, on Zoom today. I, my name is Holly M. Crawford, and I am the Director of Education at ESMOA. Um, before we get started today, we have some light housekeeping to go through. So the discussion format for today. Today's event will be recorded and available to view at a later date. ASL translation is provided today by Pro Bono ASL. We have two interpreters today. Questions have been predetermined by the panelists and the moderator. And each panelist will share a story or case study before the group discussion. We would like to acknowledge today that this event is being hosted on and broadcast from the homeland territory of the Gabrielano Tangba. We extend our appreciation and respect to all indigenous people who call these lands home. Before we begin today, I first want to provide an overview of our speakers. So on the panel today, we are joined by Avery Smith. Avery is the president of an insurance agency, community leader, and a member of the newly formed Diversity, Diversity, Diversity Equity. Avery is well known in El Segundo with his work in news sports, civic activities, and advocacy through social media. He is a proud alum of the University of California, Irvine, and a devoted husband and father. Our next panelist is Kavan Ward. Kavan is an award-winning spoken word artist and poetic activist. Within the past decade, Kavan has won first place at the historic Apollo Theater and has shared the stage with global artists Hezekiah Walker, Patti LaBelle, Fantasia, and activists like Joe Madison and Dick Gregory to perform her piece I am Trayvon Martin. Gabon is the founder of Justice for Bruce's Beach. She, has initially, she initially learned about Bruce's Beach through a post on Nextdoor when someone shared a link to a blog post that was written about it in May of 2016. She started her advocacy around Bruce's Beach on Juneteenth, 2020, when she and other co-founders of a group in the South Bay put together a picnic at Bruce's Beach to shed light on black history in Manhattan Beach. Specifically, the land stolen from black landowners, Willa and Charles Bruce. Kavan has since been quoted in the New York Times, the LA Times, and a host of other articles. She has interviewed with NPR, 94.7 The Wave, and a number of other radio stations to discuss what justice for the Bruce family means and what reparations for black and indigenous people look like as it pertains to America making amends for stealing black and indigenous land. Kavan has partnered with Patrice Cullors of Black Lives Matter to create a petition through Color of Change, calling for restitution and restoration for the Bruce family and reparations for black and indigenous residents of Manhattan Beach. Kavan is currently an actor PhD student at Antioch University's Graduate School of Leadership and Change, and a reparations educator and consultant. She is a formal Congressional Black Caucus, CBC Fellow, and public policy lobbyist. Kavan holds a BA in Communication and Masters of Public Administration. Oh, uh, Vern, could you please go back to the last slide? Thank you. Mark Knight is a scientist and photographer who pursues local social improvement through his lens. He volunteers with ESMOA, supports El Segundo for Black Lives, ESBL, and is presently serving a three-year term on the El Segundo Arts and Cultural Council, ACC. He was inspired to learn videography during a discussion with Tanya about how to make the powerful words and images of the protests available to those who are unable to witness them in person. Black and Mayberry is his first feature length production. Richard Haynes is the full-time broker owner of South Bay Boutique Real Estate Agency, Manhattan Specific Realty. With 15 years of experience in various real estate disciplines, Richard has been personally involved in over $128 million worth of residential real estate transactions as a broker of, invest of investment principal. Richard specializes in South Bay residential home sales with Manhattan Pacific and facilitates coastal development, fix and flips, small to mid-size income property and low income housing investment opportunities through his partner company, Elwood Capital Group Incorporated. Tanya Taylor is an international tax and private equity lawyer who joined El Segundo for Black Lives in 2020 as one of the founder members and coordinator for events and community education. 
As a longtime activist and advocate for civil rights and social justice, she felt that even a community as small as El Segundo needed to be woken up to the daily injustices Black people face in America. I would also like to add that Tanya is the producer of, El Segundo, of Black and Mayberry. And now I'd like to call to the stage Tanya Taylor and Mark Knight. Thank you very much, Holly. Um, so to begin, Black in Maybury. This um, was a very exciting production for both Mark and I to, to develop. Um, not so much exciting in the reasoning that um, came behind creating Black and Maybury, but more exciting in being able to connect with our community on a deeper level having that opportunity to speak with students, residents, professionals, and also visitors here to El Segundo. Um, we, we had met um, during the El Segundo for Black Lives protests here in El Segundo, uh, where Mark had come to take photographs of the protest. And we began talking about documenting the, the protest. And this led to a further conversation which we wanted to have about how we could tell these stories or share the experiences of black people in different formats and in different ways. Um, you know, we appreciate everybody that came out during 2020 to stand shoulder to shoulder with us and protest and make signs and banners and let their voices be heard. But at the same time, we understood that, you know, because of the pandemic, not everybody could join us in protest. And not only that, we have to be honest, also, not everybody's forum is our protest. And that doesn't necessarily mean that a person doesn't want change. It just means that that's not necessarily the platform which you can reach them by. Um, so by gathering the voices of different Black people within our community, we really wanted to be able to share these experiences so that people could really understand why it was that the whole nation exploded in Black Lives Matter protests. I think a lot of people got stuck on the idea that the only reason why we were out there screaming, shouting, demanding justice was because of the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery. But I think what people didn't realize was that the police brutality witnessed that year was the salt that was rubbed in the wound. The people that came together to lend their voices to Blackie Maybury, they share the wounds. So if you can imagine that these people already are carrying a great burden due to racism and discrimination in this country. And then on top of it, to add outright police brutality and racial injustice that leads to violence, that, that you know, has culminated in violence, it really does explain better why we got to the stage we were at where we had the whole nation crying for for justice in 2020. I'll pass you on to Mark. Well, I think you put it very well, Tanya, as always. Tanya has been a tremendous leader throughout this process. And I think where she really showed leadership to start with was sharing those personal stories and setting an example that other people were, were willing to, to follow and excited to follow. Um, to get these stories out there. The, the process of making the film for me was a tremendous learning experience because I hadn't heard these stories. It's, they're stories that other people know. You know the, the community that was sharing these stories knew them very well. And what I, what I had missed somehow was that this piece of the community had all of these experiences under the surface that were just completely invisible because they were outside of my daily experience. And so through the, through the protests after the murder of George Floyd, these stories began to come out and it was an opportunity to 
to start to hear those hidden hidden things under the surface. And as they as the protests continued and our conversations um, continued between Tanya and myself, it it was it taught me that there's really a chance to step outside of your own experience and understand the broader community that you live in. Because everybody that was speaking was somebody that lived within a mile of me. You know, this, this isn't some distant thing. It's not a national issue. It's right here. It's right in El Segundo. And, uh, and there are our neighbors. Tanya, do you want to? Yeah, I think what Mark says is it's, it's really important to remember is that it, they, they are our neighbors and too often we have the, in predominantly white communities, you will find that black people and other people of color are living on the fringes of these communities. What I mean by that is that because there are so many stereotypes, so many racial stereotypes and because we suffer discrimination, we're under a greater burden to be good citizens. So that means that when we come across our neighbors, we are not trying to share with them any information that could make us seem like a stereotypical black person. And when I say stereotypical, I mean stereotypes that have been made and put upon us. Um, so we tend to have a very, happy, very positive um, outlook when we meet our neighbors, we're very neighborly, but we're not sharing with them the, the, the deeper experiences. Generally, it's not comfortable sharing with others your trauma. It's not comfortable sharing your pain because racism is, it's humiliating to the victim. It's not something that black people want to go around and start talking about freely because you have to process that pain and that humiliation for yourself and you want to be as far away from that as possible. So I felt that when it came to a lot of the experiences that we have, that there were very few people who truly understood our experiences and there were very few people who, despite having neighbors and friends here that are black and feeling that they were close to those people, Despite that, I didn't think that they truly knew them from the perspective of their black life. They knew them from the perspective of what they present to be a good citizen in this community. And I wanted to break down or, you know, tear the curtains open on that veil and have our black community share these things so that we could actually begin to really understand what it is like to be black in America and not just in terms of when we have extreme tragedies, but on a daily basis, the, you know, the discrimination, the microaggressions, um, the presumptions that are made. And I think that Black in Maybury really achieved that by touching on a range of very varied topics and experiences. At the, at the protest, it, one thing that stuck out was how consistent people were at showing up. It was the same people over and over. And that was notable because protesting is not convenient. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of energy. And to have consistent dedication to go out and share stories, you know, week after week to really make the point, um, that drew me in as well because you you don't do that unless you really need people to hear you need people to hear well we did have as you know the live premiere last night which was a total success we're both very happy to say we were happy that our community came out in very very strong support and those who weren't able to come out physically sent us so many loving and supportive messages. So if you didn't get a chance to actually be at the premiere, we hope that you will be able to watch it this, uh, this from today, I believe at 7.30, going on until the, until the 15th. Thank you very much for being a part of um, Black in Maybury, to all of the cast members, to all of the crew members, 
to all the volunteers and to everybody who came out last night and everybody who's here today. Thank you all. Mark and Tanya, thank you both so, so much. Um, at this time, I would like to call Richard to the stage. Okay, Holly, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I feel uh, privileged to be asked to be on this panel to share uh, some of my experience and perspective uh, in real estate. I write a weekly blog on South Bay real estate and the Black Lives Matter protests um, inspired me to share uh, some of the restrictive covenants that I see on a weekly basis on title reports throughout the South Bay. And I'll sh also share some history regarding uh, racially restrictive covenants um, throughout Los Angeles. And I thought I would start with <clears throat> a document uh, that was recorded on a property that we closed on this year in El Segundo on Acacia and Candy Cane Lane to be more specific. So an area that everyone knows in El Segundo. And if uh, the moderators could bring up the slide, I wanted to share the exact document. And if you can read that, I direct your eye to the section that says number two. And I'll read this aloud for everyone to listen if you cannot read it. <clears throat> this restriction states, this was recorded on the property uh, on Acacia in El Segundo. And the restriction says, neither said property nor any part thereof shall at any time be lived upon used or occupied by any person whose blood is not entirely that of the white race, nor by any person of African, Asiatic, Mongolian, or Mexican descent, nor by any person whose occupancy would be injurious to the locality. But if persons not of white race or persons of African, Asiatic, Mongolian, or Mexican descent be kept thereon by a person of the white race who is an actual bona fide occup occupation of said property or a part thereof, strictly in the capacity of bona fide domestic servants of such act actual occupant. Such circumstances shall not constitute a violation of this condition. So to take that all into account, essentially someone wrote a restricted covenant on this property that no one of essentially color could own the property or even occupy the property as a renter but if you were a white person who had a domestic servant working for you on the property that was okay so not only were these very intentional they were very specific um, restrictions and covenant on the property. And I will tell you from over a decade of experience being in real estate, I see these covenants on properties all throughout the South Bay and all throughout Los Angeles. And thankfully now they are illegal, but this is something that is throughout the entire city and county of Los Angeles. And I'll read a quote from Charlotte Bass, the editor and publisher and civil rights activist of the California Eagle in Los Angeles. She wrote, it is staggering to realize that 95% of this great sprawling city is restricted against occupancy by Negroes. And I would say I see documents like this all the time and that she is not wrong and who knows what was lost at the recorder's office or what we do not see today but it is uh everywhere and i also wanted to bring light to some of the uh fair housing acts and how that's affected real estate um i want to direct everyone's attention to the 1963 rumford fair housing act which gave 
fair protection in California to renters and buyers that were being discriminated against by lenders, brokers, property owners, landlords. Um, and that was the first step in California to address this discrimination. A year later, Proposition 14 um, was introduced in California to revise the Rumford Fair Housing Act, um, <clears throat> which would repeal the housing protections um, in favor of land, uh, landowner property rights. And it's interesting to see the, the system, systemic and structural racism because the LA Times actually endorsed the proposition and it passed with 65% voter approval. Thankfully, two years later in 1966, the California Supreme Court rendered Proposition 14 unconstitutional. And then it was confirmed a year later by the US Supreme Court. And then a year later, that's when the Civil Rights and Fair Housing Act of 1968 came out to make it a federal law throughout the state. And I think just to end uh, my portion of this talk, I think I'd be remiss not to point out these restrictions and how my clients today look at real estate and housing as such a cornerstone of wealth and prosperity um, that if you were barred from owning 95% of the property throughout Los Angeles and maybe even occupying it as a renter, what damages that did to your wealth and further generations of passing on that property and wealth over time. And I think it's something we all have to grapple with, with these restrictive covenants and, um, you know, really look at how it's had an impact over the very, very long term and how we can address, you know, conscious and unconscious racism that still exists in real estate today. Richard, thank you so much. And now I'm going to call to the stage Kavan. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much to uh, Tanya and everyone from El Segundo for inviting me, um, your neighbors over here in Manhattan Beach, to speak today. Um, so I'd like to talk about. Uh, this whole issue of Black people feeling unsafe in predominantly white communities, but from the perspective of an activist and um, really talking about what the demands for reparations through restoration and restitution to the Bruce family has um, done to expose the city of Manhattan Beach's white fragility and their white violence. Um, so I don't. I know most of you were uh, were in attendance last summer when I partnered with BLM, uh, the local chapter, and the global organization to hold a march and a rally out here um, in Manhattan Beach. Uh, and that march and that rally called for the resignation of uh, now Mayor Suzanne Hadley. It called for defunding the police and it called for restitution and restoration of the land to the Bruce family. And for the folks who were able to attend that, more often than not, I heard that this was, it was an amazing event. Um, it was a spiritual event. It brought culture to Manhattan Beach. But of course, there were residents of Manhattan Beach uh, and a local newspaper and, of course, Suzanne Hadley, who um, made it appear as if the protest with BLM incited violence. And, it, and they and Suzanne Halley sent out dog whistles for the citizens of Manhattan Beach to essentially come after me. And there was just a lot of fear mongering going on uh, within the, the city council, Manhattan Beach City Council. And, and I think as a result of that, like what people don't realize is the amount of, of um, danger that put me in especially uh, as a, a black single mother living in Manhattan Beach, because what the mayor did was she called out that I was a resident um, 
so that folks who didn't know would know. And she didn't mention that I was a part of a group. She mentioned that I was, um, she just mentioned me as if I was the sole person uh, responsible. And then she mentioned that I was calling for reparations, 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 and that the folks in um, Manhattan Beach should be concerned because I was going to come after them for their money, uh, which is just simply not the case. And uh, Suzanne Hatley and members of uh, the Manhattan Beach City Council know that if there was any restitution paid to the family, it would come through their insurance policy. So the, tax, the, the citizens wouldn't, you know, wouldn't have to pay for that. But anyway, so what essentially what happened after that was um, a, a couple of things, you know, there was this paranoia I experienced, right? Because, you know, once you have people coming after you, 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 you think that you walk down the street for me, I walked down the street wondering if nearly every person I walked by was someone that um, was a racist or was someone that um, would try to follow me or would put my life in further danger. Um, and so I think that is a part of what a lot of black people experience, especially when they are in the limelight or when they are uh, targeted um, specifically by, by people in power. And so what also happened is that I reported this incident to the police department and of course they did nothing about it. Um, uh, <laughs> they did nothing about it. And, and meanwhile, Suzanne Hatley is posting all of these things on social media um, targeting me. So here I am, you know, again, feeling further uh, isolated, feeling uh, further, like, like not protected, right? And that's what a lot of black people feel when they live in predominantly white neighborhoods anyway, but this, it, it just, it, it, it made it worse. Um, and so, one of the other incidents that I, I experienced living here in Manhattan Beach was uh, a little later on earlier this year, my neighbor essentially Amy Coopered me. She um, was upset that I complained about her noise. Uh, she told me that she didn't need to listen to me and called me a nigger. Um, she told me that if I didn't like it, that I should leave. And then when I proceeded to call her ignorant, she told me she was going to call the cops on me and they were gonna come kill me. And so she essentially weaponized the police against me while I was at home with my three-year-old daughter. Um, and so this type of violence inflicted on black people is dangerous. But what's even more dangerous is that this woman with no evidence was able to go into a court, get a temporary restraining order against me um, and essentially put my life at more harm because um, I couldn't protect myself. The, the very firearm I used, I purchased to protect myself because of these dog whistles sent out by the mayor essentially had to be taken from me um, until the court could prove that I was innocent. So I was essentially guilty until proven innocent. Um, and when I explained to the property management company what happened and I, what I, when I asked them what they would do about hate crimes, they ignored me. Um, they ignored my cries for protection. They ignored my cries for accountability. Um, and then I later learned that they essentially were telling people that I did assault my neighbor as my neighbor claimed with no evidence. So it's like we're constantly, black people are constantly having to prove their innocence. We're constantly guilty until proven innocent. When the burden of proof should fall on the person accusing uh, me of, of uh, you know, inflicting harm on her. Um, so I think what people fail to realize, and this is what I didn't realize until recently, is that you know, there is less than 1% of Black people in Manhattan Beach, primarily because a, a lot of folks can't afford to live here, but I think what people are missing is this fact that Manhattan Beach is not emotionally, mentally, and physically safe for Black people. Um, and so there essentially ends up being this Black flight, right? Um, and so I think that 
my priorities in terms of reparations has shifted a bit as a result of that. So instead of me wanting to ensure that Manhattan Beach does what it needs to do to provide programming so that black, more black people can live in Manhattan Beach, um, I would actually discourage black people from moving into Manhattan Beach because it's not safe. So until the city um, does what it needs to do to protect black people, I don't think it'll ever be a safe place for us. Thank you. Now I'd like to call Avery to the stage. All right, well, um, thanks so much uh, to Asamoah and to the cast and crew of Black and Mayberry um, for this amazing uh, experience. I'm delighted and honored uh, to be able to tell my story <clears throat> and maybe more importantly, talk a little bit about uh, the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee uh, that has been founded uh, here in El Segundo and in the midst of or in the hopes of being able to um, authorize uh, substantial change. And so uh, one of the things that uh, you know, when I was listening to Richard's um, uh, information about real estate and as I was listening, I realized that I had basically lived that experience. Those documents described my childhood. And I would say that um, for those that don't know or for those that did not grow up in the 1980s uh, here in Los Angeles, LA was probably one of the most segregated cities uh, in the United States. Uh, I grew up in that 5% uh, of land that was okay for black people to live in. Um, I, I heard about El Segundo, knew about El Segundo, and probably <clears throat> most importantly, I knew it wasn't safe for me to exist in El Segundo, certainly not uh, after dark. And um, that was very impactful. So I don't know how I ended up <laughs> living here, but um, as life uh, is, is full of twists and turns uh, in 2002, um, I decided uh, with my girlfriend, uh, now wife, to live here in El Segundo. And uh, the first few years were relatively calm and peaceful. Uh, slight hiccups, but overall pretty decent. Um, as my sons grew older, as we had kids and as they grew older, um, I think it's natural for parents to want to uh, assimilate or ingratiate themselves into the community. And so we did that. Uh, I was the youth sports coach. Um, and I will say that for the first, uh, for that experience, yeah, everything went off very well. I was actually surprised at the level of, of love and um, generosity that I was able to receive uh, from the residents. But what I didn't realize was that as a youth sports coach and later as the kind of city unofficial weatherman, um, that I was actually existing and living in a box. And I would call it the racial box for black people. And in that box, I was safe. I really wasn't black. I was Avery, the youth sports coach. I was Avery, you know, the good guy, the weatherman, but I really wasn't black. And I want to talk about the day that I became black. Um, I was in Vancouver, Canada, and uh, my wife called me. Uh, I was sent actually to uh, listen to a, a speech uh, from Justin Trudeau, the prime minister. That's why I was out there. And she called me frantic. And she told me that my son had been called the N-word at school. And I just, you know, it's like getting hit with a ton of bricks. And so as soon as I got back, uh, we went to the school and I felt that the school was very accommodating, but I did not feel that the school knew what to do to prevent the situation from happening again. And sure enough, about a month later, my son was called the N-word again by a different student. And the first thing that the teacher said when my son was called that word was, do you have any witnesses? Do you have any witnesses? And at that point, I realized that this school, which is highly rated, great teachers, all of that good stuff, but they were absolutely ill-equipped to handle black pain. They were ill-equipped to deal with the problems that my son was trying to present to them. And with all of those good intentions, it just still wasn't good enough. And so again, we went back to the school, we tried to talk to them. Uh, again, they were receptive, but I just, 
couldn't seem to get across the point of urgency to get out information out to the community that this was happening and for parents to talk to their kids. And again, sure enough, in another two weeks, uh, another child was called a racial epithet. And then I thought to myself, I have to do something about this. And so I went on social media and documented what happened, put it out in a post to our El Segundo Parents Network. And the first 30 minutes after I hit submit, everything went well, I got support. Uh, I really wasn't looking necessarily for support. It was more for awareness, but it was nice to feel that support. But after about 30 minutes, again, I think the city realized I was black. That's what it felt like because it was, it, why is Avery starting these rumors? Are you anti-school? Are you anti-education? Why are you trying to tear down our schools? Why are you trying to cause trouble? All of this posted in social media. And that was absolutely devastating. But at the same time, I think what was even worse was all of those families, all of those mothers and fathers, all of those colleagues that knew me, that knew who I was, that knew who what my character was, and that said absolutely nothing. Because it was like it was open season. And you know, I think that community is when people have your back and when you have their back, uh, when times are difficult. And there were a lot of people who smiled in my face, who wanted to be on my team, wanted the kids to be on my team. But when I really needed a team, I was solo. And I'll never forget that. And when we talk about pain, and I would tell everybody to watch Black and Mayberry, Tanya does a phenomenal job in describing Black pain. That's exactly, exactly how I felt. And as the years went on, I made a conscious decision to never go back into that box because I wanted to live authentically. And I felt it was more important to live authentically, to be able to take a deep breath, to be able to have my kids look at me authentically than to go back into that box. And so I became a lot more active posting on social media and really trying to get the awareness on how big of a problem, not only that we have in El Segundo, but across the country. And in 2020, when George, the George Floyd situation happened, it felt like a significant piece of this community caught up to where I was in 2017. And there were a lot of people reaching out to me, a lot of people telling me, hey, I'm sorry um, for not having your back uh, a few years ago, or how are you doing? How, how is this affecting you? And that felt good, but I'll tell you, that didn't heal the wound, unfortunately. Um, I will say this, the city did, uh, enact the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, uh, which I am a member. And I am happy about that because I think we do have an opportunity for change. I would say for those of us in El Segundo, all of us should be looking at what's happening in Manhattan Beach, all of us. You know, I, I make the analogy that if your neighbor's house is on fire, you're gonna be paying attention to make sure that your house doesn't catch on fire too. So we should be watching that. And I think we have a tremendous opportunity. Uh, one, because of the size of our city. You know, I've always said it's easier to hate an idea than it is to hate a person. And the black community in El Segundo, where your neighbors, where your youth sports coaches, where your friends, we don't live in a specific section of town. Everybody is, you know, we're a small community, but we're around and we're here. And so I think my hope for the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee is true healing. And I would share a quote uh, from Malcolm X uh, that I think describes uh, the situation right now. I would say this, and he said, um, if a man sticks a knife in your back nine inches and pulls it out two inches, that's not progress. If he pulls a knife all the way out, that's not progress. It's healing the wound. That's true progress. And we have a lot of people in this town that celebrate because we pulled the knife out an inch or two. We have a lot of people in this community, as Malcolm X says, that denies the knife is even in our back. And so it's up to us, in my opinion, from the diversity, equity, and inclusion angle to educate our community about where we are, about the struggles that not only uh, Black residents face, but all groups of color and all marginalized communities, because 
we're all part of this country, right? We're all part of this country. I was born in LA, that's part of America too. And so it's about really bringing true justice and true reform to this community. And so I'm excited about our opportunities. I'm excited that we have the potential um, to, to really affect change. And uh, I look forward to this challenge uh, together with the rest of our community. Thank you. I agree, thank you so much. Um, and at this time, I'd like to call all of our panelists to the stage. And thank you everyone for bearing with um, any tech issues that have come up today. We are so thankful for your grace. Now, before we go into the group discussion together, um, we had met previously as a group and um, decided that before we launched into the panel discussion, that everyone should have an opportunity to share a thought or reflection before going into the group discussion. Um, so maybe before we go, maybe we could go in reverse order. So Avery, since you were the last to go, maybe we can start with you and then we'll go to Kavan, Richard and Mark and Tanya. Yeah, I, I would say, so I think a, a reflection um, and it comes to, it, it's, a, it's a question I get uh, from a lot of people, what can I do? And I think there's this idea, especially from white residents, and it's been popularized that, you know, uh, let me go ahead and fly in like Captain America and use my white privilege uh, to, to jump in and speak for, you know, the, the victims of, of the black community. But I would say, I, I don't need you to speak for me. If you want to be anything, be, be the roadie that's at the speakers so that my voice can be amplified. And so I think that it's about really understanding racism, really listening, you know, in the first year of our lives as humans, what do we do? We take in information. And I think what I would say to people is what you have to understand is that we're all programmed to believe that racism is true. And we have to try to deprogram ourselves if we want to be able to help. And so it's about listening. It's about taking information in and then having those authentic conversations. I think my reflection is, um, you know, in this work, I've encountered so many people who uh, don't approach conversations um, openly, right? These conversations around racism openly, they, they approach it with a sense of defensiveness and, and white fragility. And so for me, um, I, I wanna let folks know that I have no desire or time to educate you on racism. If you wanna learn more about it, do the work. I'm only talking to you about my experiences and, and, and I'm speaking authentically about my experiences. Um, my experiences may not be yours and that's okay. <laughs> Your experiences aren't mine and that's okay. But don't challenge my experiences, listen to them. And if you wanna learn more, do the work. That's it. I think uh, reflections, you know, for myself and, and with the film um, and, and relating it to, to real estate, um, you know, I, 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 I think the story, I think it was from Keith, really struck me uh, in terms of how he tinted his windows where he was pulled over multiple times when uh, people could see into his window and when his windows were tinted, um, he wasn't pulled over anymore. And I look at that as a reflection in my real estate business because I have had um, uh, black clients who have asked me, should we take down photos of our family for uh, a listing? And it, it pains me to even hear that. But, you know, before the film and before, uh, you know, George Floyd's murder and these protests, I was naive and I went, what do you mean? This is Manhattan Beach, this is Hermosa Beach. These aren't racist towns, this is El Segundo. And me needing to be more aware for clients to understand that 
it still does exist and it may affect a home sale and the value they will extract from from that sale and and it's my job as a fiduciary to you know as Kavan was saying to do the work and learn that I can't be naive that things are okay and that I need to make sure to address concerns by clients and not think that these, you know, pictures will have an effect on a sale when they very well could, could and likely have, you know, an unconscious bias, even if people think it doesn't affect them. So it's something that I need to do more work on and, uh, you know, real estate brokers in our industry to become more aware of um, because we've got all these racial covenants and, and restrictions that have been a very big deal uh, affecting real estate wealth over decades and it still exists today. Um, and like I said, the, the Keith vignette, so to speak, in the film really went, hey, you can't see his face in the car. Is that something that happens in real estate uh, uh, in a home sale? So it was something that really struck me and was a huge reflection in my business and, and how I can hopefully uh, affect change in the future. Mark, I'm going to let you go first this time. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, I really liked what Avery said. Um, learning to listen and hear can be difficult, um, especially learning to hear. And learning how to follow can be hard. Uh, you know, in, in most of my life, I like charging out in front and taking, taking a leading role. And it is worth learning to follow. Um, our community is full of leaders who know what racism is, what it means to our residents. And they've been doing this work for a long time, uh, years, years of doing the work. And if like myself, you're new to this, um, you know, get in the back, pick up the speakers and do the work. It's uh, it's been an honor to work with Tanya because she is a fantastic leader who knows which direction to steer the ship and to, to talk to our residents like Avery who know which work needs to be done. And so, yeah, yeah, be, be part of the team. My takeaway from all of this and something that I would like everyone to really think about is that racism is a system no one's born racist systems are put into place systems are organized designed maintained restructured fitted so that some benefit and others don't that is what racism is and if it's a system it means that it can be dismantled and it means that if people made it, people can unmake it as well. Now, what I want people to do is think that only those in high power, politicians, your mayor, your Congress people are capable of making the changes to the system because history has often shown that it's the common everyday people who start a revolution that eventually forces them to make the change. So you, whoever you are watching this, you are the person who could make the difference. Now, a lot of people, when it comes to, I've realized last year, when it comes to social justice, it's not good enough just to be out in the streets holding a sign. And I truly do appreciate everybody who came out and joined us in the streets and held up their signs, but it's not good enough just to go out in the streets and hold a sign. You have to be more active participants. For example, stop inviting your racist uncle to Thanksgiving. Like so many people have family members that they don't even hold accountable for their racism. And they have these family members around their children. 
who then infect their children with racism, thus generating another generation of people with prejudice and discriminations already pre-installed. Stop laughing with your work colleagues or brushing off racist comments that they make. Again, so many of us just feel like, well, it's, I'm not gonna engage in that, but by not engaging or by not letting this person know that their comments are not appreciated in your sphere, you encourage them. It may not be comfortable to do it, but let me tell you something, it's a thousand times more uncomfortable for a black person to receive racism. So if you can just step just that little bit out of your comfort zone, you will be making a huge difference to the lives of so many people. And that's my take. Thank you all so much. And I, Tanya, I, something that you said reminded me of something that I heard in graduate school um, over a decade ago when I was starting this work in the intersection of art, education, and social justice. And something that was said to me at the time, and I didn't understand it was, it's, I think, and I would say this specifically to a white person who wants to do this work, the work of unlearning racism, the work of unlearning bias, Get over being not liked because there are people whose lives are at risk. So forget being nice. Racism isn't nice. It is vicious. It is cruel. It comes in many forms and wears different masks. Get over not being liked. So that's my position on that for the day. <laughs> Everyone, I also just want to um, Thank you all again so much for being part of this, for taking the time to, to see the film in your off hours and also attending the premiere last night. I feel we've probably answered questions one and two that we discussed. So I'm going to jump to question three, which is today we have learned about local efforts to right historical wrongs and how can we keep the momentum in the movement going? I think in order to keep the momentum and the movement going, we really have to be the eyes that ensure that we're constantly watching the progress. Because so often, and especially those in the black community, we know how some of these um, processes work, where they're often begun at a heightened time of civil unrest. And then they somehow, as time goes by, get swept back under the carpet. We can't allow that to happen. We have to be the eyes and we have to be the voices that maintain accountability. We have to keep a watch on what's happening and we have to keep poking and reminding and continuing the activities that we do here, whether it's through art, through politics, through whatever profession that you can use or skill that you can use to ensure that those who have made promises of progress and change, that you hold them accountable to it until that change is in full, full 100% effect. Right, I'd like to piggyback off of that. Um, such a great point, Tanya. I would also say like, keep your eye on the prize, but more importantly, know what the prize is, right? Because once you know what the prize is, you know whether or not you have it and you know what you need to do to get to it. So if you haven't gotten the prize, then you gotta keep going, right? And it's a matter of uh, thinking about, there's so many organizations doing the work, maybe not starting your own organization, but aligning yourself with organizations that's doing the work um, and keep your eye on the prize, work toward it, don't stop. Yeah, I, I would just jump in really quick um, and say, you know, and you guys have all kind of hit, it, hit on it already around the idea of, you know, you don't do this to become popular, to, to make a whole lot of new friends, um, because it takes a mix and a very rare mix of being very empathetic and loving 
with this need and this ability to cause disruption. Um, I think about how, you know, it makes me smile how Martin Luther King Jr. is, is cast today as this very peaceful, almost meek individual, but that man was a revolutionary. Um, and so you have to be willing to cause civil dis unrest. You have to be willing to do that along with, again, this idea of love and empathy. So you need both. And so I think from my perspective, sitting on the DEI committee, I think that's what I would urge the activists uh, in our community, um, if they're thinking about direction and how to keep the movement going, is you got to bring both of those aspects to the table. And um, and that's what's going to affect change. People need to see the underbelly of racism. And underbelly of racism is, is exposed through civil unrest. And it's very similar to, I know what most of you guys saw in 2020 with some of those counter protesters and some of the ridiculous things that we're saying. But the reason that that opportunity happened is because of the unrest. And so you need to keep that going as well. Hey, Avery, if I could pop in. Uh, you, you and Holly both hit on how this can make you unpopular. I gotta say, there's some amazing, friendly people doing this work. <laughs> I've made a lot of friends this way. Um, there's a good community trying to do this right. <laughs> and so, so yeah, some of the counter protesters who showed up waving flags, maybe you're less popular with them, but you might make some good friends along the way. It, it's like, <laughs> because it's not done in a silo, it's not done alone. It's important to have friends who remind you when to drink water, take a moment to breathe. Are you take, checking in, taking care of yourself? What can I do to take it off your plate? And, and something if I may share <laughs> about we're collaborate as, as an institution, but a person within an institution collaborating with El Segundo for, for Black Lives and Tanya and Mark the last couple of weeks, it's, it's really been cultivating a community of care, checking in every day, asking, what can I take off your plate? Um, Avery coming in um, to help us in a, in a very timely manner. And, and again, just asking like, what can I do to support you? What do you need in this moment? And I think that's also crucial to ensuring this momentum keeps going. You need friends to pick up so that you can rest and you can keep going. So oh, my friends, we are about at that time. It is 5.33. We have two minutes left to go. I'm a Gemini, but I don't want to have, I don't want to have the last word. So I just want to ask everyone, um, is there anything else you'd like to share or to promote? I would. Um, I, I like to let folks know, I mean, there are some people who think that um, since the press conference around Bruce's Beach, that the Bruce's are just automatically going to get their land back and it doesn't work that way. Um, there, we're still trying to get the votes we need. It has to go through two Senate committees um, and then to the full floor for a vote. And then it goes to the assembly, two committees in the assembly, then to the assembly floor for a vote. And then it goes back to the county supervisor's office for a vote. So there's a process. So I'd say just um, follow us on Justice for Bruce's Beach on Instagram and Facebook so that you can keep abreast of um, our calls to action because we need help getting the bill passed. It's not a sealed deal yet, so mm -hmm. help out. I just want to say a very quick thank you and a very, very big thank you to Esmoa. Esmoa is one of the most open-minded, most loving spaces in terms of a museum that I have ever known. Um, usually museums are very cold um, spaces and there's not, there's not enough um, museums who are actually reaching out to the Black community to try and create Black artists and have them show their works. And, you know, usually it's the the artist who goes to seek the, the platform or the space. It was very different with Esmoa when I when I started um, with Ask Gunda for Black Lives, they actually reached out to me first. And I thought, I guess they don't know that I'm the local troublemaker. <laughs> 
but they, they, they knew exactly who I was and they felt that it was important that they provide a platform that would be able to encourage diversity and inclusion in this city. And I think that's a beautiful thing that, that they didn't even have to wait for me to find them, that they actually reached out and sought a way to ensure that this community had more diversity through its arts as well. So thank you very much, Esmoa. us with this extreme, extremely important narrative, and I should also add an incredible work of art. I want to thank um, all of our panelists today, Kavan, Avery, Richard, um, thank you so much for entrusting us with your stories as well. Um, thank you, Pro Bono ASL, for providing translation services and support today. We are so, so thankful for you. And thank you to our guests who joined us at the time of this recording. It will be available to watch at a later date. And starting today, May 12th at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, guests can stream the Black and Mayberry film on ESMOA's website. And to learn more and to register for your virtual ticket, I encourage you to visit um, www.esmoa.org. Registration is free. And it will be online through Saturday at 7.30 p.m. So please do help spread the word, hashtag Black and Mayberry Film. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. Be safe and be well, everybody. <music>